um, speaker. But first of all, um, we already have some speaker here. There is Mr. Tanyo Sebastian. Yes, you already here. Please come in front. <laughs> the seat is yours. And then, oh yeah, for this session we will have three speakers. The first one is Mr. Tanius, and then the second one is Ms. Um, Mardian Sulistiati. Yay! Uh, can you can ask please give a pause? Thank you. And then, last but not least, there is um, Ms. Lena Moose. How should I pronounce your last name? Moose. Okay. Okay. We skip the age. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, you can arrange your presentation. Okay, so everyone, we need uh, more time to arrange this uh, session because there are some adjustment in the presentation and the live streaming as well. Yes. Um, maybe we have uh, five minutes before we start the session. Okay. about the technicalities issue are we good okay we i'm sorry that we still need to wait for a few minutes okay yeah okay okay hello everyone welcome to the um panel two day two thank you uh, that you are still here i know that some of you may uh, have another business but you are still here i really appreciate it and now we are entering the second panel of the day uh, the theme is indigeneity democracy and human rights we will have three presenters today and we have one and a half hours but um, uh, hopefully we can um, manage our time wisely because it's already like you know <laughs> not really on time we supposed to start it for like 20 minutes ago Okay, without uh, further ado, I will start the first presentation. It will be done by uh, Mr. Tanio Sebastian. He is a young scholar who is doing teaching, researching in the cross-disciplinary legal field such as state theories, legal ethics, comparative law, philosophy law, and legal research methodology. Please, Mr. Tanio, the time is yours. 20 minutes, please. Good time. afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, the time constraint is uh, really tight and I do not expect to uh, explain all of my ideas uh, that 
uh, have been written in my paper, so uh, I hope uh, I can uh, present it briefly here. This is my uh, title of my the, the title of my paper, and um, I would like to uh, explain uh, my individual background here. Uh, I have two interests in particular here in, in the field of jurisprudence uh, as legal theory or legal philosophy and in legal pluralism discourse. And beside those two interests, I also uh, put my focus on two issues. The first is indigeneity, indigenous rights and indigenism. And the second one is adat, adat rights, and adat communities. Okay. Okay. And uh, for the disclaimer, uh, uh, I try to explain uh, my research, and um, uh, I try to 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 give the explanation uh, negatively what this research isn't about. Um, this research isn't about the uh, exclusive lawyer's perspective. Um, I have a uh, legal studies background, but uh, now I am, I am actually an academic lawyer, not a practicing lawyer, and my perspective here is uh, not just a uh, perspective from uh, lawyers, uh, practicing lawyers. And uh, the other is uh, this research uh, is it about formal state sanctioned legal precepts or solutions. And um, also um, I do not intend and to present the empirical uh, field study. So uh, my research is more about the exploration of ideas. Uh, I try to uh, go deep into the uh, terrain of theoretical ideas. So um, <coughs> the ideas is uh, surely not my uh, original ideas. I try to draw on uh, from several sources. Uh, I want in on uh, I want in on discussion uh, with uh, these giants, these academic giants. Uh, as you can see, uh, the first is uh, from pluralist jurisprudence uh, discourse developed by uh, some uh, legal theorists, Andrew Halpin and Brian Tamanaha, Kristen Anker, and the Second one, uh, I would also to uh, join uh, the discussion about the methodology of uh, jurisprudence and legal theory. As uh, you can see, there's uh, several authors. I would also uh, participate uh, to discuss ADAT, ADAT law and legal pluralism trajectories uh, developed by uh, famous names here. Von Volnoven, Muhammad Kusno, uh, and so the Benda Beckman couple. And the last, uh, as for the uh, theme of indigeneity, I, uh, I try to, uh, to uh, also develop my ideas uh, based from the work of legal anthropology of indigenous rights and political economy of indigeneity. Inter Alia by Mark Goodell, Jimmy Davidson, Tanieli, Yancha Arizona, Adrian Bettner, and Liz Mulyani. And uh, uh, just for the um, introduction, it's for the intro for uh, you guys here uh, that maybe uh, not familiar with the uh, jurisprudence field or, or legal field. Pluralist jurisprudence is a recent trend, development, and style in which jurisprudence uh, encountering the legal pluralism issue. And uh, a little excerpt from my paper, uh, I contend that the long overdue for critical reassessment 
is a square replace on the construction of Adat Indigenity Rights Movement by Indonesian jurisprudence, which in turn overshadowed by decentralized state interests. And this is my contention that Indonesian legal education has played a vital role. As uh, you might uh, know, AMAN, the organization of uh, the national indigenous people uh, in Indonesia, AMAN in their first congress um, made a bold statement. In Bahasa, uh, I would say, Kalau negara tidak mengakui kami, kami pun tidak akan mengakui negara. If the state will not acknowledge us, then we will not acknowledge the state. This is the uh, really famous statement from AMAN as the indigenous uh, national organization. But uh, Greg Akioli not, already noted that uh, AMAN uh, has already moved their uh, attention, uh, their mission from recognition to articulation of indigenous sovereignty. So um, it, me it means that uh, in a movement, in the, in the movement uh, area of indigenous uh, advocacy, there, there has already uh, a change that uh, a change of focus from legal recognition to articulation of sovereignty. Nevertheless, Adat is still positioned merely as one of the legal subject. And my question is, where are the law school and legal education? And now uh, about legal pluralism. I already stated before in my prior research that Legal pluralism is a blind spot for Indonesian legal culture and Indonesian legal tradition. First, there are laws and or norms outside any products of state-making authority. Legislation, regulation, court decision, policy, uh, and so on, you name it. Um, in the uh, legal reality of uh, Indonesian tradition, uh, we can uh, find that uh, the effective uh, norms is not just uh, produced from the uh, state sanction authority. And next, uh, the debate about legal pluralism typology. There is a hot debate, there is a, a strong debate uh, in, uh, in the scholarship of, about legal pluralism. Uh, the famous one and the very influential one is the uh, weak strong model initiated by John Griffiths, a legal sociologist, and the uh, current uh, model developed by Brian Tamanaha, manifest sociological and supranational model. Uh, this means that the legal pluralism is very, uh, very key and very strong uh, notion that uh, very uh, have have uh, have had a very influential uh, uh, influential uh, ideas and uh, the third uh, I would uh, state here about the constructivist vis-a-vis -vis the frictionist perspective on non-state uh, or uh, living laws the mainstream Indonesian legal science uh, has never failed to buy in the ideology of unified, centralized, harmonized, nationalist uh, state and society relationship. And this is why I say that legal pluralism is a blind spot for uh, Indonesian legal tradition uh, and Indonesian legal thought. And in my paper, I uh, I try to make a argument, an argument about the twin ivory towers here. Uh, I 
I identify it as uh, legalism in indigenism, indigenism in legalism. This is, uh, of course, um, a metaphor, and I try to uh, juxtapose uh, the uh, these two sides, and then I um, try to track down the genealogy of uh, legalism and indigenism ideas. And I quote here from my paper, uh, a conjuncture of methodological nationalism and legal sources, the so-called sumber-sumber hukum, paradigm that leads Indonesian jurisprudence to fail to appraise the ubiquity of legal pluralism in other rights and communities. Methodological, methodological nationalism and a legal source paradigm uh, is uh, a very uh, strong uh, factors that um, that uh, influence the uh, development of uh, Indonesian legal thinking, and as we uh, hear uh, yesterday, I think when uh, the when we was participating in first plenary session, there was a discussion. Uh, and also from the uh, second plenary session from uh, Professor Sofia, I think. Uh, uh, this, uh, this factor of met methodological nationalism is, uh, uh, is a really uh, main uh, factor that uh, impede or inhibited the uh, development of development and uh, discussion uh, between pluralism and uh, legalism. Okay. Indigenism and legalism, uh, I find that there is uh, a, a disjunction between adapt as indigenity strategies to demand state recognition through its lawmaking powers and adapt as legal pluralism manifestation. And I also uh, find that there is a changing trend of academic interest on adapt movement in Indonesia uh, from revivalism to project, a tension between friction and construction. The changing academic trend, uh, I map out uh, three of it, and uh, the last uh, section of my paper, I uh, discuss uh, the theme, uh, how to do things uh, with pluralist legal theory. Uh, the ideas uh, is inspired by Cole Kirkby from uh, Sydney Law School. And uh, my intention is to bring our uh, focus and bring our uh, our uh, discussion about the pedagogy, pedagogy of legal theory. And I also uh, evaluate the three academic camps that I already mapped out before. And for the conclusion, uh, uh, the two uh, problems that I uh, identified before, uh, the first is why the adat and indigenity rights should be connected to legal pluralism and jurisprudence. Uh, my uh, answer is the theme of changing indigenity politics from revivalism to project can still be carried on. And uh, for the uh, Last question, why jurisprudence should be concerned with legal pluralism and adat indigenity rights? Uh, my answer is the original calling of uh, the jurisprudence and legal theories is, uh, is also the uh, legal pluralism and adat indigenity rights. And that's all for my presentation.
Okay, thank Terima you, kasih. Mr. Tanya Sebastian, for your presentation. It's very interesting how to connect pluralist jurisprudence and the legal pluralism in the indigeneity study. Um, we will talk about it later, but now we will go to the uh, our second presenter is um, Mrs. Mrs. Mardian Sulistiari, yeah, <laughs> and then she will be present uh, her paper titled "Do I Have to Choose Between the Two? Being Muslim and Lesbian in Indonesia." Please, Mrs. Mrs. Dian, uh, you have 20 minutes to present your paper. Please. Okay. This, okay uh, thank you for introducing me, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. This is uh, the the question: Do I have to choose between the two? Uh, is uh, my lesbian friends always questioning about this? And I would like to to start our discussions uh, from the question of why. Why do I have to choose? Why do we have to choose? Or why do they have to choose between their sexuality or their religion? And um, um, the social problems that I think we absolutely know is um, homophobic. And the homophobic uh, usually come from the negative negative uh, religious beliefs or the bias of a uh, uh, paradigm of religious belief and this uh, negative point of view uh, then formed uh, fatwa MUI uh, fatwa majelis ulama Indonesia nomor 57 tahun 2014 about gay lesbian uh, sodomi dan pencabulan see uh, they put lesbian and gay at the same level with pencabulan and sodomy, with so sexual abuse. And, and uh, um, I think the negative, uh, the, the fatwa is uh, make many possibilities uh, of traumatic experiences, of uh, discriminations and the persecution and penalty to the people who, who are, uh, who doesn't uh, heterosexual. And then um, uh, I I try to to um, uh, I try to um, uh, describe the social problem into the academic problems, and um, this is um, we we can see in the left side there are three boxes: sexuality, religiosity, and heteronormative. And the sec the uh, what I'm gonna say is um, the limiting concept of sexuality and religiosity can form the heteronormative beliefs uh, but if we if we can uh, if we can think more deeper uh, about our if we can uh, consciousness our sexual uh, our sexuality and spiritual uh, spirituality we can we can uh, live and see beyond the heteronormativity and here we go we we are in the Muslim lesbian uh, sites and uh, this is what uh, I did is uh, exploring how Muslim lesbians uh, manage conflicting areas between their sexuality and religiosity uh, selves and then reconfigure their sexual identity and religious piety and to do that uh, I explore uh, I, I interviewed um, six Muslim lesbians, uh, Muslim lesbians uh, uh, in the term of uh, women who are sexually uh, both physically and emotionally attracted to other women and, and, and at the same time consciously um, identify, identify self as a, a Muslim. And uh, I call them my lesbian Muslim friend as Rekawan. Rekawan is uh, my abbreviation of relawan uh, or volunteer and kawan or friends. Uh, because why I call them uh, Rekawan? Because they, they are happily to get along with me and to share uh, their uh, story. And um, they are coming from six cities in Indonesia. Bogor, Jogja, Samarinda, Bandung, Jakarta, and Serang, Banten, and they they have uh, 
various ages range from 22 to 32 and then they are coming from uh, have a various uh, activity uh, student activist labor teacher freelancer and designer and then various education background high school to postgraduate um, here uh, we now get to the main part uh, this is the three zones my uh, uh, zones of establishment process of self uh, in the in the uh, the 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 first zone the red one is the coming in um, coming in is the fundamental phase uh, coming in is the process of lesbian individual to accept uh, their sexual orientations and uh, this is a basic or private issue and and this phase uh, they were making self dialectics and uh, about their sexuality in a spiritual ways um, yeah, uh, this is um, in this phase. Uh, every my every rekawan, my every rekawan Muslim lesbians, um, they uh, commonly uh, facing self uh, conflict, self conflict uh, between my sexuality or my religiosity, and then they are also uh, rethinking, rethinking about their faith and desire, and then they were always challenged. Uh, they their self feeling and this all steps uh, this all step um, is uh, from a lab uh, an ethic lesbian ethics uh, uh, lesbian ethics come from a uh, so comes from journeys experiences uh, liberations and resistance between uh, by presenting new possibilities of their life and Yes. Um, after that, uh, after the the first uh, the first steps, uh, they are um, they are they are uh, commonly develop try to develop an autonomy. Uh, developing autonomy means uh, they try to delegitimize delegitimize uh, the mainstream interpretations of the doctrine, and in or, or in other words, um, they sim symbolically uh, separate themselves uh, to, from the authority or the negative religious beliefs to the new interpretation or new belief uh, that more friendly and more compassionately, and then uh, the second zone is also about coming out coming out process or coming out is a uh, effort effort uh, of recognizing uh, accepting and sharing with others uh, how they identity in terms of sexual orientations and this is the public or social uh, dialectic phase and when they came out uh, they were they were uh, face um, uh, some situations and they give uh, some reactions and the, uh, in my lesbian my, my recurrent cases there are at least four situations the first one is stigmatization and familial uh, rejections uh, that's why that's why uh, some of uh, many lesbians uh, prefer to close uh, them, themselves or like and, and live uh, live in identity that is not real uh, and and the openness is only conducted among their close friend and the second one is normal marriage in Indonesia uh, marriage is on uh, somehow is is like a tools tools to sorry to cure to cure uh, the lesbianism uh, many many our society believe that uh, uh, but uh, for some 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 friends uh, making marriage is also a good thing a strategic things to to be a political uh, because uh, it can accommodate uh, the society or the uh, family expectation uh, about their sexuality and then it, it at least it can uh, they can get um, uh, public recognition uh, as a normal. 
Um, and the third is third uh, situation is mental health risk. Uh, yeah, it's of course, and they that's why they always uh, grouping. Uh, they always uh, make a group or a community to support to be a support system and survival systems. And the last is LGBTIQ plus 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 visibility dilemmas. Uh, some of them uh, happy happy uh, about the uh, about their visibility because uh, the more visible uh, visible they are, the more uh, they are near to get uh, back their human rights. Uh, they can restore the justice, but uh, some of them also worry because the more visible, the more they will insecure uh, in, in insecure uh, situations. Um, and this is also about uh, uh, the what they faced. And um, all my rekawan, all my rekawan get stigma and bad judgment. And this buzzword illustrates how social, uh, so how society construct uh, the lesbian image. And uh, but, however, at the certain level, my rekawan also built um, built a self constructions. They counter the buzzword. Uh, with the wise words, um, they always said, uh, is, uh, because it's Muslim context, uh, they said, uh, Islam is a religion of justice and rahmatan lil alamin for every human being. And uh, God creates us to do good things and how we become the best version of ourselves. Uh, yeah, they try, they always trying uh, to build a good conditions. A uh, uh, and compassionate constructions of self and mind, um, and this is the part of developing autonomy and reclaim the self. And what I wanna say is, um, what I wanna say is, uh, all in in all steps, in all uh, the self establishment steps. Uh, there are ups and down. There's some. They they oftenly ups and 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 often falls uh, falls down uh, because the reality of self awareness and acceptances of being lesbian orientation doesn't automatically make uh, them happy. Uh, but uh, by adopting a more progressive understanding of social justice and respect for diversity and equality can help them to be more uh, proportionate, uh, proportionate in seeing and experiencing religious journeys and sexuality uh, at the same time. And this is um, how they reclaim the self. I'm, I'm, I am lesbian and I'm Muslim. Uh, I think okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Dian. Um, she presents a very interesting but also quite sensitive issue in Indonesia, especially when we are talking about human rights. And thank you for provide a detailed story on how um, the lesbian community try to reclaiming their rights in certain area. Okay. After hearing a story from Indonesia, now we are traveling to the Philippines. We have Mrs. Lena Mus here, and then she will be pre uh, she will present her um, paper titled "Assessing Human Rights as a Social Justice Tool for Indigenous People in the Philippines." Um, you have 20 minutes for presenting your paper. So Time is yours. Stand up, please. please stand up. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Lena Mus. I work as a research and communications manager at Forum ZFD. So I'm not working at a university, but I'm working at a peace-building organization. Uh, and that's also why the... Uh, I just pressed down. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, then I'll just ask you. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, so the, yeah, the research project is actually part of our conflict transformation work. It's part of the applied peace research that we're conducting uh, within the organization, meaning the challenges that we're dealing with in, in the research come out of our conflict transformation work and then ideally the findings of the research go back into our peace building practice. So this specific research project came out of the challenge that uh, in the Philippines and also specifically in Mindanao where we're based, um, it's very difficult to work on human rights. Human rights has become a very sensitive topic. Uh, and so at the same time, there are some organizations that continue working with it and others have stopped using the framework or the language altogether. So the objective of this research was to understand for those organizations who continue to use it, how do they actually use the human rights framework and then why does it continue to be useful for them? Um, and to do that, we conducted 15 key informed interviews both with our partner organizations and then also with other organizations just to mitigate any type of bias we have already in the selection of partner organizations. Okay, next. Uh, so I'll present first some of the general findings looking at the human rights movement in general and then I'll zoom in on indigenous people's rights advocates. So if we look at the Philippine human rights movement the way it is now, it's still very much rooted in the unified resistance to the Marcos dictatorships um, during the 80s. So we had back then organizations, different types of civil society actors coming together, church groups, but also the radical left, including its armed wing, the New People's Army, coming together in resistance to the Marcos dictatorship. And a lot of that resistance was formulated using the human rights language, formulated in a way of exposing human rights violations, using human rights as a way to, to organize campaigns, but also to reach out to international solidarity networks. So then when, when Marcos was ousted and, and uh, that dictatorship ended, there was a, a dramatic expansion of civic spaces uh, because now organizations could, could freely organize, could freely mobilize. So there are a lot of new organizations that were founded uh, right after the end of the Marcos dictatorship, a lot of them with a human rights mandate. But also during that time, this, this kind of unified quality of the movement slowly broke down. So, so previous disagreements started flaring up again and we started seeing a fragmentation then of the human rights movement. Um, so what we have nowadays is we still have a very strong expose and oppose tradition, so a very strong tradition of using human rights in a way to expose human rights violation and then oppose them. And we still have those solidarity networks that were built during that time that still exist until today. So we have a, a strong human rights movement in that way. Um, at the same time, and also coming out of that tradition of that, um, of that that alliance with the radical left and also with the New People's Army during the time of the Marcos dictatorship, we've been having ever since uh, red tagging, so the, the accusation of a civil society actor of being a member or a supporter of the New People's Army as an omnipresent threat. And uh, um, that, that tag, that accusation, very often leads then to physical forms of violence, to, to killings, to warrantless detentions, um, enforced disappearances, etc. Next, please. So um, recently then we can say that, that the human rights movement has really come under attack and that's specifically under the past administration of, of Duterte um, where there was a very, very strong anti-human rights rhetoric that was demonizing both the concept of human rights and then anyone associated with it. So the entire human rights movement, any human rights activists as being uh, protectors of criminals, protectors of terrorists, as being instruments of the West, as being motivated only by their own political agenda um, as being anti-patriotic, anti-unity, so there was a whole range of allegations. And what happened was through that demonization, those human rights activists also faced diminished public trust. So it was much harder for them to engage with communities, even communities they already had an established relationship with, because there was a lot of mistrust towards uh, any human rights actor. And of course also that enabled further violent attacks against human rights activists and, and advocates there was really a spike in killings and, and also other forms of violence. So it was described that, especially during the time of Duterte, uh, human rights was really in a survival mode, both literally because human rights activists had to navigate all of these threats to their security to survive, um, but also conceptually because the entire concept was called into question and, and human rights as a strategy really was called into question. Next piece. Uh, so nevertheless, there are still organizations that use the human rights framework and uh, the organizations that we interviewed, they found three main reasons why it continues to be useful for them. Uh, the first one was that if they experience different types of violence or they're documenting different, type of different types of violence, 
uh, formulating those and, and documenting those as a human rights violation means that they can then access accountability mechanisms. And that's accountability mechanisms both on a domestic level and then also internationally. And they were also saying that if they document these types of violence and they call it a human rights violation, it automatically communicates that it's a grave, a grave situation, right? It automatically communicates the severity of the situation when it's called a human rights violation. Then secondly, um, they appreciated human rights as a tool for community empowerment. One way of doing that is by applying a human rights lens in needs assessment and also in the, in the design of interventions and projects. And doing that, using that human rights lens, means that automatically the project or the intervention will focus on those who are most marginalized, those who are the subject of, uh, of human rights violations. Um, it will also mean that by focusing on them, the intervention of the project will tackle abusive power relationships. So that's in a way to, to make sure that uh, projects and interventions have this kind of empowerment uh, aspect to them. And then of course also human rights education itself as a form of, of empowerment, as a form of building critical consciousness, uh, building that understanding of oneself as a rights holder who can legitimately claim and assert their rights, which is really the, the precondition for any type of, of social change. And then thirdly, they appreciated uh, human rights as a meta framework for mobilization. Um, and really the broadness of human rights that allows organizations that work on very specific issues, that work maybe on, on climate change or they work on, on sex workers or they work on political participation for youth, but they can all come together under this broad umbrella of human rights. So it allows this kind of mobilization across various issues and also allows them to build alliances using human rights symbolism. So for example, the International Human Rights Day is celebrated by a wide range of organizations that can all come together because they have this shared symbolism. So when we now look at indigenous peoples, um, of course that's a, a part of the population that has been uh, subjected to human rights violations for a very long time. So they've been suffering through histories of colonization and displacement um, that still continue into contemporary forms of marginalization today. So we we have the issue that a lot of indigenous people don't have access or control over their ancestral domains um, that are denied the right to exercise their self-determination, their self-governance. They also lack access to basic social services and, uh, and experience a lot of human rights violations in the context of uh, extra extractive industries. Um, so we have all of these issues. At the same time, indigenous peoples have been part of the human rights movement ever since, since the Marcos time. Um, and we see also forms of collective mobilization across distinct indigenous peoples. So for example, in Mindanao, we have the collective identity of Lumat, which is not one indigenous people, but it's several indigenous peoples in Mindanao coming together, forming this collective identity to express their shared concerns, shared issues, but also their shared assertions of their rights. Um, and one of the main achievements of the indigenous people's rights movement has been the passage of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act in 1997 which is a very progressive piece of legislation to, to protect indigenous people's rights. Um, so obviously indigenous people's rights advocates are human rights advocates and they face the same type of challenges as non-indigenous human rights advocates, but there's also a few additional challenges that, that they're facing. Next slide, please. Um, so for one, as I said, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act or IPRA is a very progressive piece of legislation. It's the, their main tool to assert their human rights at the same time, it already has inherent shortcomings. Uh, one is a very slow and bureaucratic process of claiming ancestral domain land, which is the precondition to, to then exercise self-determination, self-governance, and the entire range of rights that comes with that. And the problem with this very uh, long process of ancestral domain titling and registration is that while indigenous peoples are using that law and, and going that process, their ancestral domain continues to shrink so there's still continued land grabbing and their, their basis for their self-governance and for asserting the indigenous people's rights uh, is shrinking in the, in the meantime. Uh, another shortcoming is that the, the Indigenous People's Rights Act transfers a lot of power to a government agency, the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. Um, and by that, it takes actually away some of the authority that indigenous leaders should have. It takes away some of the self-governance and transfers this to that uh, government agency. Then, of course, any type of assertion of the IPRA law happens in a context 
that's characterized by, by significant economic inequalities, widespread corruption, uh, very abusive power dynamics. So the, the tool itself, the human rights tool of Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, is often being abused actually by, by powerful people. And it's the processes that are meant to protect Indigenous peoples, like the free prior and informed consent, are being used and turned around and actually used to limit um, Indigenous self-governance. Then we have some situations, so if we look at indigenous people's rights as a tool, it's really conceptualized as a tool of protecting indigenous people's rights vis-a-vis a dominant mainstream population, dominant mainstream non-indigenous society. But we have some areas, including the Bangsamoro region, where we don't have that type of relationship, but rather the majority population can also be considered indigenous. Uh, so we have overlapping indigenous people's, overlapping claims of self-governance, which is an additional challenge for those um, in the minority to claim their rights to use this tool uh, when they're faced with, with actually just as valid and just as legitimate claims of, of self-governance. And also uh, an additional challenge for them is that doing so, so th those that are not part of the Moro majority, when they try to assert their rights to self-determination and self-governments, they often face the allegation of being anti-Moro autonomy or anti uh, against the peace process, being spoilers of the peace process. And then lastly, indigenous peoples are disproportionately uh, exposed to this risk of red tagging. There's a, a, a common idea that the N NPA, the New People's Army, predominantly uh, is composed of uh, indigenous peoples and that leads then to just a general suspicion towards indigenous people. They're very often accused of being members of the New People's Army. And at the same time, the areas that are left for them, that are left of their ancestral domain, are often the same remote, remote mountainous areas where the NPA is active, where they're hiding and where also encounters with the, the armed forces are happening. So a lot of indigenous communities are heavily mil militarized. A lot of indigenous people's organizations are placed under surveillance. And there's been a lot of indigenous defenders that have been killed also because of that. So we have these additional challenges. At the same time, also here, we have uh, indigenous peoples organizations that find usefulness in, in the human rights framework. Next slide, please. Um, so similarly to non-indigenous human rights defenders, uh, formulating issues as a human rights issue, again, communicates that severity. And they were saying that when we call it a human rights violation, and we don't just call it an issue of our indigenous people, but we call it a human rights violation, that's when we are heard. So that's a way to, to access um, external audiences. And it's also a way to access support from uh, both non-governmental organizations and government agencies that have a human rights mandate. And here the focus is not so much on accountability as with the, the broader human rights movement, but it's really accessing any type of support uh, by using this human rights framework. Then secondly, we also have community empowerment but what was stressed among indigenous people's rights advocates is that human rights can be a very effective tool in communities that have been marginalized for so long, where so many forms of violence have been normalized, different types of prejudices have been internalized already. So using this human rights lens can really help them to recognize their own lived experiences as a human rights violation and then understand different forms of repression, put them into context with each other, and then finally also be able to assert their rights with that understanding and recognition. And then lastly, um, they also use this, this idea that it's a meta framework for mobilization, but what the indigenous people's rights advocates stressed was that when they face issues within their indigenous community, then they have their own tools, right? They have their indigenous self-governance, they have indigenous political structures, they have methods of conflict transformation, et cetera, et cetera. But in moments where the issue they're facing involves an outside actor or it involves another indigenous people, that's the moment that they can refer to human rights as a common framework of reference. Um, and that's when they can also mobilize across distinct peoples, across, across distinct cultures and have human rights as, as their shared uh, framework for mobilization. And then uh, another point under, under this idea of a meta framework is that they were saying, uh, formulating their issue as a human rights violation, it allows them to, to put it into relationship with other types of human rights violation. So they can use this to really stress the interdependence between indigenous people's rights and other types of rights. An example they gave 
was to, if, if they're claiming and asserting their right to ancestral domain, if they make that argument not only based on their indigenous right to self-determination, but connected to the right to a healthy and clean environment, connected to issues of, of the right to health, et cetera, et cetera, then that really strengthens also their advocacy. So that's also something that the human rights framework offers to them. Okay, I have no idea how my time is, but... Okay, cool, well, <laughs> I didn't expect that. Uh, I'm actually done, but I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, because I could be talking about this way longer, so I'm happy, happy to answer questions later on. It's about our land. Oh, so you finished already? Yeah, I finished okay, already. Okay, okay. I was tripped for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, um, Lena, for um, telling us how, that you have a very comprehensive effort uh, in using human rights framework to support the indigenous people in the Mindanao. I know it's not an easy task, <laughs> but uh, you various strategy is very important and uh, it, it shows that in um, eliminating the uh, right, uh, violation of rights, we need um, various strategy and the network and then you just explain it to us, it's very interesting. So we have a um, Q&A session. Um, I will have an open this term for three questions maybe, one, two, and then one more question? No? Okay. Oh. Three. Okay. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Mbak uh, Chairman. Uh, Chair, uh, thank you for the three presenters, and I uh, really enjoy your presentation. And uh, I have a question for uh, uh, three of you. I think it's kind of was that I have a link between all of my uh, question. First, from uh, Mas Sebastian. You have always the, uh, proposed the uh, indigeneity or adat, you use the uh, term adat, right? Should be connected to legal pluralism and jurisprudence. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm very, was the, a very uh, uh, awam with hukum uh, discipline, law discipline. Uh, as long uh, uh, as a deep, uh, I read about jurisprudence, it's about uh, the judge decisions. So it means that there is a subjectivity of, uh, aspect of the judge itself. Uh, if we counter with the, the history of how indigeneity uh, process recognition of indigeneity in Indonesia, there's a historical fact. Just last day in witness the forum with CRCS, one of historian uh, scholars uh, tell us about the, the history of in the, uh, State, Indonesian state recognition pro, uh, history of uh, indigeneity. Uh, she said that uh, about the term itself, there is a, a shifting or change from kebatinan to aliran kebatinan to kepercayaan and then move to adat. So from a religious aspect, move to secular aspect. Adat is very secular. So one of the uh, French scholars say uh, Tuhri and also Anju say that when the, the government uh, see if the, the indigenous, uh, indigenous to adat is kind of secularization of indigeneity itself. So if you propose that jurisprudence is, is, will be connected to indigenous right, yeah, I think this, this kind of recognition is also impact the judge, uh, judge uh, decisions. So how do you, uh, what kind of proposed you was that uh, from you as a scholars of law to tackle that issue? I think this will be problem when a judge, for example, uh, have the secularization of indigeneity uh, impact of his decisions, I think it will be bad decision for the indigeneity itself. For example, the problem of Kauhape now, when they used to try, to try it was that to, 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 to take uh, indigenity customary law to uh, format nor normative law of Indonesia. I think it's kind of was that uh, will be bad impact for indigenity itself. And uh, uh, I linked, I tried to link to the gender uh, issue. Uh, maybe it's not your, 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 I don't know to is, is or expect us or not, but the human rights have an issue also about the, the intersection issue. When you talk about indigeneity, there's also gender issue. And most of the 
as I, as far as I know about indigenous, indigenous people, uh, not most of them just uh, was the uh, friendly about gender. For example, I'm, I'm, I just I, I'm, I'm a Batak man. For us, a Batak man, women is subdued to men. Yeah. So in the intersection, intersectional issue, how to tackle that? When you talk about human rights and indigeneity. So and also, uh, Miss sorry, Miss Lena also used human rights as a tool, as a tool. So when you use human rights as a tool, and that will be was the face with the the problem of intersectionality, on the human rights itself. Uh, uh, indigenous people uh, commonly use a community as a as a was the, as a tool to solve any problems. So not not individual aspect, but community. So I just worry and also uh, yeah worry when you use human rights as a tool towards that for indigenous. Maybe it will be uh, it's force indigenous people or community to be changed. At least raise the the rights of their community, uh, because uh, indigenous people very was the very. Uh, the unity of themselves, they, they, even uh, one of the elder of Iban said that, yeah, human rights, we didn't, we didn't talk human rights, we talk about not just human rights, but three rights, river rights, land rights, and the other rights, not just human rights. So maybe when you use uh, human rights as a tool, this will be was the problem with the indigenity people itself. So how you was that to tackle that? That problem. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Maybe next question. Uh, thank you so much. So my question will be for Ma Mardian Solistiati. Uh, just now you mentioned that your kawan uh, say that um, Islam rahmatan lil alamin, right? So can you elaborate more? Um, what do your kawan mean by? Um, Islam rahmatan lil alamin, or maybe what do they understand from uh, this um, sentence or phrase, yeah, rahmatan lil alamin? So that's all my question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for the question. Last question. Hi, I'm Margareta from the University of Melbourne and Universitas Erlangga. I have two questions, one for presenter number two. I, I really appreciate your process on describing the three layers for gaining your own rights as a lesbian and Muslim in Indonesia. But I see that it seems like more internal or individual level processes. I wonder how the external forces, for example, the rising of conservatism in Indonesia, influence the three layer process, for example, on how they do the internal process coming out and also regaining the rights. Does that have the interaction? And second question for Lina. Yeah. Um, if you ever heard, in Australia, we just now had this uh, launch uh, indigenous, um, oh no, sekarang uh, lupa pakai bahasa Indonesia, referendum on indigenous rights. So giving more representative into the concept for making constitution about themselves. So. Sometimes we kind of trap into like the savior complex. I will speak for you, but to some extent, the indigenous community that had been enduring colonialization, you know, having someone else to speak for them, it's not the best idea. It's not the ideal. So would that be appropriate to address this issue in Philippines? So it's not us coming there and speak on their behalf, but how about them? into the constitution committee so they can make their own regulation and according to their needs. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, okay, I can just give the... Okay, um, let me respond for the first question. Okay, um, first, uh, there are various meanings of jurisprudence. So in Indonesian legal discourse, in Indonesian legal thinking, uh, if we define jurisprudence uh, 
uh, if we identify jurisprudence as a judge or court decision uh, that is only uh, the there is only one version of the jurisprudence meaning and uh, exactly uh, like you said if we uh, define the jurisprudence as the judge or court decision there is a real danger and I attempt to identify also the danger the danger is uh, when we uh, when we uh, make uh, jurisprudence meaning uh, similar as the just decision we put the uh, jurisprudence uh, as the legal sources and I already uh, present in my slides that the the real dangers is uh, when uh, when the legal uh, scholars and legal practitioner use the paradigm of legal source the so-called sumber sumber hukum and uh, uh, I come from uh, the legal academia and uh, so I consider myself as as an insider in legal academia and in this forum in this conference I try to bring uh, our attention to uh, legal scholarship and legal academia uh, so uh, my critique is uh, we cannot uh, we cannot limit the meaning of jurisprudence just as uh, one of legal sources in Indonesian legal system and if we talk about the scholarship the 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 broader uh, scholarship in legal uh, theory as I already mentioned uh, before jurisprudence is also considered as uh, the method or methodology of uh, of thinking like a judge or like a lawyer so the emphasis here is not on the uh, on the sources where uh, we can find uh, the law and uh, where we can find uh, the answer to the normative answer to um, legal problems or uh, uh, legal challenges the the main uh, idea I think I think is uh, how to make jurisprudence as uh, uh, a landscape of discourse uh, uh, a part of the debate uh, a, a scientific or scholarship debate so uh, jurisprudence is I think is not uh, limited uh, to uh, to the field of uh, legal scholarship or to the uh, expertise that we left to uh, to we leave to the so-called law faculty or uh, the lawyers um, so uh, yeah um, I agree with you that there is a real danger when we put uh, the meaning <coughs> of jurisprudence as legal sources and uh, that is my main critic to uh, legal mainstream legal education in Indonesia Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mas Dian. Um, maybe directly go to Mbak Dian. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, do you mind if I answer in Bahasa? Yeah, uh, it's, it's okay. 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 <laughs> I will I'm try to uh, yeah, translate yeah, it. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> takutnya misleading. Um, but uh, to everyone who doesn't uh, speak Bahasa, we can discuss outside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have to answer it carefully. Um, saya akan ke pertanyaan kedua dulu, maaf uh, Mas. Uh, yang, yang pertama, ini agak sederhana tapi sulit karena ini pertanyaan yang long life. <laughs> Tentang, <laughs> ya ini pertanyaan yang ini. Um, rahmatan lil alamin, uh, bagaimana para rekawan saya menerjemahkan itu, sebenarnya itu sangat sederhana tapi sulit sekali diaplikasikan rahmatan lil alamin artinya uh, mereka memahami itu sebagai kasih sayang itu untuk semua 
So as simple as that. Uh, kasih sayang untuk semua. Mereka memahami uh, Tuhan penciptanya memberi, uh, menciptakan ma setiap makhluknya uh, baik yang bernafas uh, secara uh, makhluk hidup maupun makhluk yang uh, tidak bernyawa itu semua punya kasih sayang dengan porsinya masing-masing. Dan uh, mostly mostly my, uh, my uh, enam, enam, enam orang rekawan saya ini punya paradigma yang esensialis. Esensialis berarti mereka memahami bahwasanya uh, seksualitas dalam diri mereka itu adalah given, pemberian dari Tuhan. Jadi tidak bisa diubah bagaimanapun uh, uh, kondisinya, bagaimanapun orang tua, keluarga, ke lingkungan itu mengusahakannya. Uh, mereka kebetulan enam orang ini punya paradigma yang esensialis sekali. Sehingga uh, ketika mereka memiliki orientasi seksual yang seperti ini, uh, maka itu adalah... Uh, given, takdir, uh, Tuhan memberikannya seperti itu. Mereka hanya perlu uh, berupaya lebih lagi dibanding dibanding teman-teman yang heteroseksual, yang cis hetero untuk untuk uh, hidup dan 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 menjalani kehidupan. Jadi kalau pertanyaannya apa sih rahmatan lil alamin karena mereka ini mengalami mengalami bukan uh, mereka tidak datang dari background uh, ya mereka tumbuh dari keluarga yang sangat agamis tapi tidak dengan uh, tradisi tafsir menafsir yang dalam tentang tentang teks-teks agama tapi mereka sangat yakin bahwasanya uh, sangat tidak adil kalau Tuhan menciptakan mereka dengan 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 cara yang yang sebenarnya tidak berterima sehingga mereka memahami itu sebagai uh, compassionate gitu uh, dan kemudian untuk pertanyaan oh, mau ditranslate dulu mbak oke okay. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, it's quite challenging for me because I need to translate some kind of a religious term. Okay, um, so uh, the meaning of rahmatan lil alamin, alamin is um, basically so simple, but it has very deep meaning. It's very complex. Um, for for short, it means that God uh, creates love for all. Actually, every human being they have. Um, love and also uh, caring uh, for others. So um, from the six rekawan, rekawan stands for uh, volunteer and friends, and then in short, we call it rekawan. They understand the, the term um, or their, not term, sorry, they understand their sexuality is something given from God itself. So uh, that it, that's what Mbak Dian calls with essentialism. So um, when they, think that um, this is given from God, it's not only us who create it, it's just unfair that the society just um, like, you know, judge them and then um, excluded them from uh, their rights and etc. I think that's all. Hopefully I translated in a good, <laughs> in a right way. Well, thank, thank you, you thank Madian. You. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for the second question. Um, um, yeah. Dependent dulu atau gender? Yang pertama akan jadi yang terakhir. Oke. Okay. <laughs> Oke, okay. uh, tentang proses, proses internal teman-teman saya. Um, uh, ya betul bahwasanya um, ini apa yang saya sampaikan itu mungkin tidak ada setengahnya saya mewakili teman-teman uh, itu uh, mem, uh, apa ya, um, me, 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 mengalami proses demi proses. Tapi ini saya coba secara akademik untuk me, 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 apa yang memformulasikan poin demi poin apa yang mereka lalui tapi um, bahwasanya mereka mengalami coming in dahulu itu 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 memang sangat dalam dan setiap uh, personal itu unik prosesnya sangat unik um, jatuh bangunnya dinamikanya itu sangat sangat unik dan berbeda satu sama lain tapi yang paling berat adalah coming in proses internalisasi karena Um, mereka uh, uh, ya kita hidup di, di negara di masyarakat yang memang sangat um, sangat heteroseksual uh, sangat uh, 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 sorry sangat heteronormatif dan dan um, uh, itu tidak mudah gitu mereka men, mereka untuk untuk tahu bahwa dirinya itu memiliki ketertarikan dengan teman uh, dengan dengan uh, yang 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 dalam masyarakat kita dianggap tidak wajar itu juga sangat susah kemudian uh, mengetahui itu kemudian meng mendalami itu dan kemudian menerima itu itu pun proses yang yang jatuh bangun dan bertahun-tahun dan mengalami um, um, kondisi psikologis yang 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 tidak mudah gitu dan kemudian ketika coming out dan membentuk 
uh, proses itu juga proses yang um, apa ya yang yang sangat uh, uh, berat karena uh, ketika coming out ketika bicara tentang seksualitas itu misalnya ke orang tua ke keluarga yang terdekat itu seringkali akan dikeluarkan dari kakak gitu uh, uh, ya ya uh, um, tidak mudah gitu dan dan makanya uh, banyak juga yang memilih untuk tidak terbuka kepada orang tua tapi lebih memilih kepada teman yang yang memang sangat sangat mereka percaya kemudian juga um, tapi pada proses yang ketiga ini menarik proses uh, apakah mereka akan tetap memutuskan untuk memeluk agama yang 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 dari lahir ia peluk atau tidak beragama atau berpindah agama yang lebih ramah terhadap uh, seksualitas ini ini juga proses yang sangat uh, uh, panjang tapi ke, uh, karena saya berfokus pada saya ingin tahu karena um, kita mayoritas di sini muslim dan gempuran ide tentang homofobia dalam dalam agama Islam itu juga sangat uh, tinggi sehingga uh, saya penasaran bagaimana uh, proses ini uh, mereka alami gitu dan Um, menjadi menjadi muslim itu berarti mereka juga harus berani uh, selain selain sudah stand for uh, themselves and juga berani untuk um, untuk keluar dari otoritas keagamaan yang mainstream uh, dari doktrin-doktrin dari tafsir-tafsir yang mainstream dan dan mencari uh, penafsiran yang lebih ramah uh, seperti itu uh, semoga bisa menjawab dan untuk pertanyaan Mas yang pertama um, bagaimana meng- menghubungkan ini iya betul um, uh, kita tidak dulu masuk ke wilayah seksualitas yang yang sensitif ke wilayah gender Saya dari Bukit Tinggi, terminologi gender pun di kampus UIN Bukit Tinggi misalnya um, anti. Jadi saya bisa bilang 10-90 persen um, gender itu sangat anti. Misalnya ketika masuk sebagai dosen maka ada ada pertanyaan ini off the record tapi ya it's okay. <laughs> uh, tapi tapi bukankah uh, kampus semestinya jadi percakapan yang jujur ya betul ya. Um, Um, uh, saya juga punya teman yang uh, dia perempuan kemudian dia masuk ke mendaftar sebagai dosen uh, ada wawancara yang ditanyakan apakah kamu setuju dengan feminisme dan gender that's the question and itu weird sekali ya yeah. um, uh, itu terjadi terjadi di lingkungan akademik um, saya uh, saya sangat bisa membayangkan bagaimana itu terjadi uh, itu bisa kita uh, sinkronkan di wilayah akar rumput. Tapi yang paling penting adalah mungkin bukan di istilah gendernya, bukan di istilah feminismenya, tapi di nilainya, di value of uh, our movement, our ideas. Uh, jadi uh, saya pikir uh, sebenarnya gen, uh, konsep gender, konsep feminisme itu juga uh, kita punya masing-masing lokal, masing-masing lokal kita, masing-masing uh, indigenous system kita punya sistem itu. Hanya saja kita uh, apa ya uh, mungkin perlu kepekaan khusus untuk untuk uh, me, me, mengangkat itu uh, jadi uh, ini bukan lagi soal bagaimana uh, ini sulit ya pertanyaannya karena apa yang kita kalau ini sudah selesai persoalan ini interseksionalitas gender dan indigenous ini kalau sudah selesai nggak akan ada mungkin forum, forum ini karena di sinilah kita <laughs> me, apa ya uh, Um, ya mengeksplor untuk terus mencari uh, kehidupan yang 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 ideal ini um, maaf semoga bisa menjawab Mbak Hos <laughs> silahkan oke okay. I'll do my job <laughs> oke okay, so Mbak Dian um, si answering the last question and then uh, it's about the internal process on the uh, the community itself. So basically Mbak Dian explained that there are three processes. Um, first of all is in coming in. It's not an easy process actually because there are a lot of um, uh, personal struggle uh, inside the uh, the community itself uh, because we are living in, in, the, in the heteronormative society. So the international, the interna, the internalization process, which is the second process, is also um at another barriers um because you know um you usually when they are trying to um in before they're trying to coming out to the friends or the family they need to internalize it, internalize it before but then um 
like you know when they're trying to go to the the third process coming in coming out um, yeah they usually choose to uh, tell their uh, peers their friends first because um, most of the Rekawan they live in a religious um, family even though they not um, came from some kind of um, um, religious and very uh, very well known in reading the the the, the Al Quran, um, but still the their family have a uh, some kind of religious norm that which is uh, kind of against them, and they are afraid if they are telling the family they will be um, eradicated from the family member or kartu uh, keluarga in Indonesia, so. Um, um, in the process, the internal process, they will um, go to the peers first before the family, and then um, another impact is um, in the in the religious itself, um, because um, it, this case is about the Muslim community, right? And then there are certain values in in Islam that is um, not really accommodate them. And then um, at this stage, some of them are try um, rethinking whether they will um, stay in that religious or maybe they will find another um, community still in the same religious, but they have different um, discourse on seeing the the their um, sexuality, or maybe they also trying to see another religious who uh, which also uh, can accommodate their beliefs and failures. I think that's all for the third question. Um, and the last uh, question is, is about the intersexuality between um, uh, gender and the indigenous itself. Um, well, it's actually um, it's a long and unfinished process if we are talking about the inter intersectionality and gender. But it's also it's quite challenging because when we are talking about gender, um, not all community, um, even the academic field, there there is some kind of resistance. Um, some of them still asking, um, do you prefer in certain uh, gender or not in the um, in the recruitment? Uh, which is for me is also a big question. But um, um, it's it's just one of the example how the gender discourse is um, face any challenges, for, even though from the academic field itself, from the scholars, and then um, if it's so that when we are talking about the gender and intersectionality, um, aside from the movement itself, we can see from the value itself, even though the. Um, the movement is some kind of restriction, but the value about the gender intersectionality and on even the indigenous um, value, they, we can still see it. Um, one of the way is for, by translating the gender, the value of gender in the local term itself, because um, usually in, a, in, in our area or in the indigenous community, they have their own term on what is gender. And then it, it is one of the very effective way in how to translating the gender norm into um, indigenous um, issue. I think that's all. I hope I did it well. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, we ha we still have ten more minutes. Do you have? Oh, Lena. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Lena. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I was also mesmerized by how well you were translating. Okay. Um, okay, so I think the question was about human rights as a tool for indigenous communities, considering the, this idea of community no, rather than individuality. So yeah, the, the research, I think that's, that's maybe something to keep in mind. It really looked as human rights as that, as a tool for social justice. So it didn't look into, you know, to what extent did they identify as human rights defenders or activists or what's their philosophy of human rights. It didn't look into that at all, but how do they use it really in, in practice, no? And, and there, um, there's definitely that collective assertion because the, the right of self-determination is a collective right in international law. It's, it's not an individual right, but it's one of the few that are a collective right. self like the entire indigenous rights declaration is a collective uh, right, and it's the same in the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act in the Philippines, it's, it's a right that can only be claimed as a community. So if indigenous communities, if they claim their ancestral domain, if they get the title, it's not an individual that owns the land, they own the land as a community, and then within that land, 
they can exercise self-governance in accordance with their traditions, their, their means of doing self-governance and, and their political structures. Um, at the same time though, there were some of the research respondents that were saying they also use human rights, uh, individual human rights internally within their communities. And that's something where there was some disagreement among the, the research participants. And I think it also goes to show that, yes, they claim their right as a collective, but they're not homogeneous either. You know, there are some in disagreements within indigenous communities. There are some things that they're, uh, they're contesting about. And one of the, the groups that we work with closely, um, we work with a lot of in the female indigenous leaders, and they're actually in their community they're challenging some of the traditional norms because of course not all of the forms of indigenous self-governments that they have the right to exercise are actually in line with human rights, no? So some of the, the indigenous methods of conflict transform or, or leading with conflict um, are through death penalty. That's not being practiced anymore, but that's the traditional way, you know, that's how it used to be done. Um, then there are some other examples that are still practiced. So for example, if there was a rape in the community um, usually the way indigenous leaders, at least in the Agusan Manobo community that we work with, um, they would deal with that by, by encouraging them to get married, the perpetrator and, and the victim. And in their thinking, it makes a lot of sense because they're trying to prevent a, a, a conflict. They're trying to prevent revenge killings, you know, so to prevent that, they let them get married and then that won't happen. Um, but there are a lot of members within the indigenous community that are challenging that and that are using individual human rights, women's rights, etc., to have this conversation inside their indigenous community. So they use that as well, whereas there are other communities that say, we use human rights only to collectively assert our self-determination towards outside actors. Inside, we only use our, our indigenous self-governance, we don't use human rights at all. So there's a bit of, a, you know, depending on the community, but for sure, the way it's exercised uh, is collectively indigenous people's rights. And I thought that was interesting what you said in terms of the rights of, of trees and, and, and the nature, um, which of course isn't in the, the Western human rights tradition. Um, in the Philippines, when, when an indigenous people gets their ancestral domain right and can exercise self-governance, then they also have control over the everything that's in there, right? Over the land, over the, the nature. The only thing that's excluded is subsoil resources, which is a huge problem because it still enables mining, etc., etc. But they can take care and, and deal and, and use the resources in the way they want. So they could practice things like rights of trees within their ancestral domain, but there's no concept like that in the, the mainstream uh, Philippine law. I think it would be interesting to see because if we think of human rights as a tool, one big thing is human rights language. So it would be interesting to see how effective it would be to apply human rights language to plants and nature in like conservation and climate change efforts, no? But I would really think of it as a tool rather than maybe like such a strong philosophical belief or something that they, they have rights, but as a tool to, to make an argument. Um, and then, yeah, I vaguely heard of that referendum, but I, I don't really know much about it. I can only speak uh, to the Philippines, where there was a very big shift in how to deal with indigenous peoples with the 1987 constitution, so the constitution after the Marcos dictatorship, where they shifted from assimilation and this kind of paternalistic, you know, we grant you rights, we grant you something because you're so poor, you're so marginalized, na na na, to you, you are indigenous peoples, you are nations, you know, you've, you've resisted colonization, that's why you still exist compared to, you know, the mainstream Philippine population that was assimilated by, by Spanish colonization and then later US, etc. cetera. So, um, so yeah, that shifting of thinking that was there with the 1987 constitution and then much more with the IPRA law, where it's not, those are not rights the Philippine government is granting to indigenous peoples. Those are pre-existing rights of self-determination, self-governance, and they're only recognizing them. So that shift in language is definitely there. And um, while I'm not sure if there were indigenous peoples involved in the formulation of the constitution, definitely the IPRA law is, um, is an achievement of the indigenous peoples' rights movement. And there are many indigenous peoples' rights advocates that 
are saying, you know, they see all the problems with the law and the way it's been Im implemented in practice and there's so much corruption and like all of these issues. But there's also many who are saying, this is our law. We fought for this. We were able to pass this. So now we cannot let it be corrupted by other people. We cannot let it be implemented by this agency that often acts against our interests. We have to kind of reclaim it as a tool for, for our rights assertions. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely there. And then for us, obviously I'm not indigenous, I'm not even Filipina, but uh, we try to, as much as possible with, with you know, the, the kind of histories that we're all part of and the, the, the colonization context that we've been part of, it's, we try to, as much as possible, um, really also reflect that in our work, that kind of understanding and, and uh, we co-create projects with our indigenous partners and, and we don't come in and be like, okay, this is what you need and we're gonna come and deliver it. You know, that's <laughs> definitely not the case. Okay. Thank you. Can we give a pause for the three presenters? Okay, I'm sorry, Lina, I didn't mean to leave you, but I'm just sorry. Yeah, um, actually, uh, because we have a time constraint and it's lunchtime, I know uh, most of us are already starving. <laughs> and it, we have a very serious discussion, I think. Uh, we have very different uh, theme and then with very, um, um, very serious question as well. And then, but thank you once again for our three presenter. And then thank you for the participant. You can get your lunch in the auditorium on the fourth floor. Once again, can we kiss a pose for the last time? Thank you.